Hello, welcome to SIPS Level 3, Revision Tips for Advanced Certificate in Procurement and Supply Operations. This is Module 2, Ethical Procurement, Learning Outcome 4, which is to understand how operational performance of the procurement and supply function can measure, can be measured sorry, and improved. So we're going to cover things like the importance of delivering good customer services and how to improve it, ways to measure cycle times and lead times, and methods to assess the performance of and control of budgets. So try and think about a time when you've received good customer service. What happened? How were you dealt with? And now think about a time when you received bad customer service. What went wrong? How were you dealt with then? Think about the factors that contributed to the good or the bad experience you've just thought of. But a good customer service can be achieved um, if you answer the phone and emails promptly and courteously. Making promises that you can deliver on. Delivering good and bad news honestly, not just the good. Don't, don't hide the bad news under a stone. You need to be open and honest. Encourage feedback so that people can tell you how they feel about the customer service so that you can take action. If you're not encouraging feedback, then you honestly don't know how your customers are feeling. Try and resolve complaints efficiently and effectively and always be polite, willing and helpful. Here we can look at some methods to evaluate customer service and stakeholder satisfaction. We can conduct reviews or surveys to try and get feedback about how satisfied customers are with either the product or service that we've delivered or to determine stakeholder satisfaction. We can analyse spend, assess the relationships, are they adversarial or collaborative? And assess the loyalty. If a customer or stakeholder only ever uses an organisation in that question, it would suggest they're content but are they going elsewhere? You know, they might be buying some from you, but some from elsewhere. And then review your social media. And this is to understand what customers and stakeholders are feeling. And you may be able to intercept low satisfaction at a very early stage. So coming back to analysing spend, if customers are placing orders for goods and services, it suggests they're happy with the level of service they're getting from your organisation. If spend is decreasing, it indicates they're not very happy. So as you can see on this, um, this particular slide, one is going up and one is going down. So the one going up implies that they're happy. I would be reaching out to the one going down to ask them what's wrong. Now, once your satisfaction levels have been evaluated, you might want to put in place an action plan which you draw up to improve performance. You ask yourself the following questions. What is the current state? What, where are we today? What is the desired state? Where do we want to be? When do you want to reach that desired state? Is it next week, next month or next year? And how are you going to reach that desired state? And once you've asked, answered those questions, you, you can then take action, drawing up an action plan, identifying smart objectives that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time bound. Creating and prioritising tasks that meet those objectives, establishing how to achieve those tasks, what money do you need, what, what resources do you need? Make sure you set the deadlines and always have a backup plan. Now, occasionally it could be because of an individual, not necessarily a, um, a problem for the entire organisation, but just one specific individual who needs to improve. Um, if that's the case, I would recommend you um, looking at a PIP, which stands for a Personal Improvement Plan. It's a type of action plan geared towards personal improvement. It's not always easy to understand why an individual isn't performing. It could be that they haven't had the training or they don't understand what you need of them. 
this outcome, the PPP essentially is to look at an outcome to improve that performance and recognise if there are any gaps in the training. It can also be used for long serving employees who have been in the same position for a long time, who are then moving into a new role. But if a procurement worker is failing to perform by not meeting their objectives or achieving cost reductions, then a PIP could possibly be used. But go, you have to go through a number of stages such as, you know, firstly, documenting what the issues are, making sure that you've got specific and factual evidence, developing an action plan, looking at things like training needs and resources, reviewing it to make sure it's fair and reasonable and it doesn't actually have anything in there that's a sort of wild accusation. Then you meet with them, the individual, explain what, what the PIP is, um, give them time to give you their feedback, and then at the end, get some signatures so that you both confirm and accept that the action plan that you're going to work towards. You should have conducted regular follow up meetings and discuss the progress that you're making. And actually success should be noted, encouraged and you know, a bit of recognition goes a long way. The final stage is the conclusion stage. It's either closed because um, the improvement plan has been met or you might want to look at setting new objectives for further improvement. Or lastly, if um, there's no improvement at all, you might want to take proceedings to terminating that employee's contract. The next part of this chapter looks at evaluating timescales for the sourcing progress and sorry, process. And evaluating timescales for, for procurement in the sourcing process looks at both cycle and lead times. So the cycle time is much shorter. It's the amount of time it takes to convert raw materials into a finished product. It's the time taking to produce one unit, sometimes called the production time. And it is important that you understand the production or cycle time so that you can calculate accurate lead times. The lead time though, is the amount of time it takes to produce a product and deliver it. It's the time including placing the order, the supplier receiving and sending the order. The same importance applies to lead times, appreciating all factors that contribute towards them. And the things that could affect them include speed and of the internal um, procurement team in sort of, I suppose, responding to um, requisitions. But externally, it could be because of market forces. Maybe there's a lack of available suppliers or a lack of product availability. Too much or too little competition the time zones, the location, language barriers, custom checks, the transfer of funds, but also the complexity of the order. It will be much quicker to buy an off the shelf solution than it is to deliver a bespoke um, outcome. And the tools and actions that can be used to measure and help deliver timely products and therefore reduce the cycle and lead times include using MRP systems, which is materials requirement planning, JIT, just in time, or the Kanban process, which is the two bin approach. You can also review suppliers, contracts and KPIs, manage and maintain the relationship, ensuring that you get open communication with suppliers, but clearly not with all suppliers. You need to be doing this with your critical and bottleneck strategic type suppliers. There are many potential causes for delays that can impact on cycle and lead times, but there are actions that can be taken to reduce the impact as well. So if we start with the first one, defects, clearly this is when goods arrive and they don't pass quality control. So you need to identify these at an early stage using sort of quality assurance methods. Delivery issues, if a supplier is delivering an order late can be monitored and addressed by effective expediting. Demand exceeding supply. If the requirements are higher than the amount of product available, you can address this by sort of keeping abreast of the market and industry news to avoid any surprises, but also having a backup supplier. Force majeure is uh, occurrences that are sometimes referred to as acts of God. They're unforeseen circumstances that could disrupt production, transport and human life and can be prepared by having a backup supplier in a different country. 
human error. This is mistakes made by procurement professionals or colleagues. And you address it as soon as it's uh, noted and take action. Everyone makes mistakes, it's fine, but you need to learn from them. Industrial action is strikes by workers, which could mean that factories are not operational. So do keep abreast of the news. And if induct industrial action is planned, you could, for example, order deliveries more in advance. Changes to legislation and standard, um, let's say a product or a raw material that you're currently using would become illegal. You must make sure that you are keeping abreast of any changes and plan for that in advance. Machinery breakdown, this is technical glitches of machinery um, within the buying organisation, which can be avoided by having regular servicing and maintenance. Raw material shortage would be um, a shortage of raw materials due to market forces or a global shortage. Um, again, you can mitigate this by having a backup supply, but I think in the main, if there's a sort of global shortage, it's affecting everybody. And then um, supply financial problems. If a supplier is unable to pay their suppliers, um, it will cause an issue, but you can avoid that by carrying out regular credit rating checks on your suppliers. We're now going to look at budgets. So budgets is a primary tool that an organisation uses to monitor the expenditure and income. So it's used for planning, tracking and controlling expenses within a business. You produce this at the beginning of a financial year and a tool for decision making. Establishing how much money has to be generated in order to pay all the bills and leave an amount at the end for profit. So in essence, it tells an organisation how much it can afford to spend. There are three basic um, aspects to budgeting. The first is to plan the income. So how much do you think you're going to sell? Then you plan your expenditure. So how much do you need to buy in order to make that sale happen? And then you predict your profit. Now, there are two main types of budgets that you can see on the screen. You've got CAPEX and OPEX. And CAPEX budgets are for capital expenditure, like property, land and machinery. And by capital, we mean it's assets that the company is going to keep for a long period of time. OPEX budgets are um, for operational expenditure, like stationary raw materials, IT equipment or stock, basically. Things that are going to move in and out of the business very quickly. And TOTEX is the total expenditure of the two combined. Now, this shows the process that an organisation can follow to create an accurate budget. Over the course of time, actual expenses are then plotted against the budget to identify if any differences in value has occurred. And that's, that's referred to as a variance. So determine the current position. What assets do you have? What's your market position? What are your opportunities and threats? Set or review your objectives. What does the business want to achieve in that period? Then look at your market pricing, research prices and trends of your potential sales and expenses. Then you estimate income that needs to be generated. Calculating predicted revenue from sales. You deduct your fixed costs, take off the ongoing costs like rent and utilities, and estimate and deduct the variable costs. So take out costs that could vary with output, such as the cost of materials. Deduct any one-time purchases like capital or one-off purchases. And then you project your budget result. This figure is the predicted budget result for the end of year and should be a plus figure, not a negative. So as I said earlier, a variance is the difference between what the budget was and what you actually spent. So why do budgets actually vary? What's the reasons for it? I mean, budgets can be overspent or even underspent. And the variance should be calculated and the nature of the variance should be um, in, should be investigated and the reason behind it. Now, variances can be temporary or permanent, meaning that they can correct themselves. So there are certain times of the year where, um, let's say, in the winter, you might use more gas and electricity. 
whereas in the summer you will use less so it's a temporary variance that will correct itself in the later months a permanent one though won't correct itself maybe the minimum wage has increased and it's continuous it's going to continually be at that higher price for their for their on in but the reasons why budgets vary sometimes is sometimes down to a lack of understanding from the individuals they don't really understand the impact they're having on the budget it could be poor management people just signing stuff off when they haven't actually checked if there's enough money in the budget left being inefficient ordering lots of small parts in small requisitions which all attract additional costs it might be price fluctuations whether that be the commodity price or the um, exchange rate any changes in the economy it might come down to poor budgeting in the first place so they haven't actually prepared the budget correctly or it could be an unforeseen circumstance like a flood now organizations often track budgets at departmental level and this graph shows the budget versus the actual spend so you can see the exec and the board um, have underspent whereas facilities management have um or oh, they've also underspent who's overspent let's have a look design has overspent so just one to bear in mind now discovering variances um, by carrying out regular monitoring and evaluating the budgets can enable you to take action and try to get the budget back on track Potential actions could include communicating with employees to provide some insight as to why the budget's been set in that way and the implications. Um, setting related objectives to re reduce the likelihood of the variance. Implementing cross-functional working to reduce variance by process improvement. Stopping unnecessary usage, turning lights off when they're not, use, not used. Cancelling planned expense, increasing your selling price and exploring other forms of income like renting out your space, selling your assets or restructuring your business. Try and train your staff to develop their knowledge of the procedures, plan in advance, be proactive rather than reactive, benefiting from better prices. Um, you can use Kanban or MRP just in time systems. Regular monitoring and feedback, frequent checks that can highlight issues and implement actions to bring things back in line and working with procurement to try and reduce the costs. Reducing overtime is another way as well to bring budgets back on track. The ones that you can take with your suppliers would call, um, include ordering in larger quantities which will clearly bring the price down, changing packaging styles to reduce the cost, reducing the payment terms, collecting goods rather than getting them delivered, or extending the contractual period because suppliers are likely to um, give you a better price if you're committing to them for a longer period of time. Um, I said earlier they can either be temporary or permanent um, in terms of the variances. And then we've got the positive and negative, so um, it either be above or below what you expected it to be. And that's the end of uh, Learning Outcome 4. Thank you for watching.